Namaskar. Today I'd like to talk about existential crisis and its cure. Today existential crisis afflicts many young people. Sometimes it afflicts people in middle age also. Or anybody that's going through some significant life change like loss of a, a dear one. In the existential crisis, there's a crisis of meaning. Where is my role? What is my role? What is the purpose of life itself? It's a very painful experience. We become like a popcorn. We look very nice and normal outside, but inside there's an emptiness. And I remember one person came to our center and she was in this existential crisis and she decided to travel. So she went to Thailand, she went to Nepal, she sent back beautiful photos of her places that she went to. And then she came back and said, empty, emptiness. Life is so tiring without a goal. Or another person came to the center and he confided that he had a, a huge hole in his heart, yawning gap in his heart. And he tried to fill it with stock market trading, daily stock market trading. But that is a very, very stressful job and he was not ready for that and he went deeper into debt. So, so much unhappiness there. Today's materialistic life is encouraging this way to live and we have used the science more for making weapons than for educating about life culture or about the benefits of meditation and so on. And we've used media, mass media, not for sharing common people's ways in which they, they surmount the challenges of their life, but we use it to encourage this culture of consumption and more and more enjoyment of physical pleasures. So this existential crisis, people have different ways in which they deal with it try to manage it. Some take drugs, prescription drugs, to, to suppress those feelings. Some people escape through alcohol or binge eating, travel, psychedelics. Some people talk it out through psychotherapy. And the most common or a common one today is retail therapy or shop until you drop. In fact, many people think that through psychedelics, there's no need to meditate because the same effect can be had from psychedelics than from meditation. I'd like to explain the difference between the two. Actually, although psychedelics have helped people and help people that have mental disorders, it is not recommended for a permanent long-term use. I remember one of my colleagues who had he confided that before he became a Dada, he used to take psychedelic drugs. And there came occasions in his life as a Dada that he had complete blank out. His mind went completely blank and he forgot everything. And the most famous example when I was young was a Harvard professor by the name of Dr. Richard Alpert. And Alpert, along with his colleague Timothy Leary, they experimented with the drug LSD back in the 60s and early 70s. Alpert went on a search, spiritual search in India, and he came across a, a, a yogi, Neem Karoli Baba, and he gave him a dose of LSD just to see what would happen. And he was so surprised that Neem Karoli Baba hadn't felt any difference in that dose than his normal state of bliss <laughs> or joy. And Neem Kroli Baba encouraged Alpert to, to seek higher consciousness through meditation, spiritual practice. And that was a turning point in his life. And he received initiation and a name from his master, Neem Kroli Baba. Baba Ramdas was his name, and he became a teacher for thousands of people in the United States and all over the world. I remember my experiment with marijuana in those early stages before I meditated were not always pleasant. And particularly one night, I was driving my father's Lincoln Continental car, and I crashed it on an icy winter night. And that moment, I thought, no, there must be another way how I can find the answers to these gnawing questions about life and meaning of life. 
And one week later, I met a, a dada, a yogi came to my university, and from that time I learned meditation. So the difference, is, the difference between psychedelics and meditation is that meditation reaches us to that higher consciousness, but slowly and gradually. And there's no ill side effects. It allows for the natural growth and expansion of our mind. Rather, we also feel relaxed and stress-free in meditation. And just a little bit of that experience, of that state of unending joy, it, it feels so refreshing and new. It's like taking a bath in that ocean of consciousness. Because in daily life, our minds are full of thoughts, maybe worries, maybe anxieties, maybe stresses, problems, joys also. But when we meditate and we try to reach towards that subtler level, then it's like we wash our minds of all of these impurities and take a bath in that subtler realm. So then we can say that there are many types of meditation, and they stem from the classical interpretations of yoga, even thousands of years ago. Patanjali said, yoga chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga is the suspension, nivritti, the suspension of, of propensity or, or, or thoughts. The human mind has about 50 propensities. It flows, it moves along these propensities, love, joy, anger, surrender, hope. And so to suspend them, it is a type of suppression of the natural flow of mind. And where do those suspended thoughts go? So, suspension means no colors, no thoughts, no, no enjoyment of the world. So, this is one definition of yoga. And another was sarva chinta pari kago nishinto yoga uchate. The stoppage of mental flow, reaching the state of composure where there's no thought, is yoga. But mind moves. Mind moves in this we call jagat, universe, moving entity, to, to forcibly stop the flow of mind or the thoughts in the mind. It is an unnatural way to reach our goal. So the third definition of yoga which we follow, is clear. The goal is merger into unit consciousness, into cosmic consciousness. Sang jogo jogo ik yukto jivatma paramatmana. The merger of jivatma, unit consciousness, in cosmic consciousness, paramatmana, is yoga. So yoga is the state of oneness, union. In their search, for the ultimate of matter, the quantum physicists, they arrived at the conclusion that the universe looks more like a great thought than a machine. So they have realized that there's something mental in this material world. And the yogis went one step further and said, that thought actually comes from the consciousness itself. That which is beyond thought, that which is the witness of thought, the non-causal being or supreme consciousness. So the goal in yoga and through the meditation is to merge our consciousness, our unit consciousness, in that cosmic consciousness. So in this way, we can know about the, the classical yoga given by Krishna, in the Bhagavad Gita, he outlined three ways to approach that goal. The yoga of knowledge or jnana yoga. The yoga of action or selfless service. And the yoga of devotion or love, bhakti yoga. Jnana yoga without the service element, it can be a type of dry practice. And I remember two people who were doing other meditation, they came recently to our meditation, 
because the other form of meditation made their minds feel a little bit detached from the world. There was no clear goal in the meditation. And so they were feeling a little bit spaced out. Uh, but in the meditation they have learned and that with the mantra and the related practices that we teach in this channel that develops them physically, mentally, and spiritually. The goal became clear. Einstein once said that in order to solve a problem, we have to go to another level beyond where the problem originated. So the problem of existential crisis or the crisis of meaning, it comes in this material level, physical level, mental level, where our whole society is moving in this physical enjoyment of life. And that means moving in the spiritual level. So, in this way, we practice the meditation. Whenever we buy a, a machine, there's a user's manual that comes with the machine. If we don't follow the instructions in the user's manual, the machine may not work. So, this human body is a machine, we call it in Sanskrit yantra, a machine that performs a function. So our human body-mind complex is a biopsychological machine that performs different mental, physical functions. And the mantra is also a machine, and its function is to bring the mind to higher consciousness. So when you learn your technique of meditation from your teacher, you learn how to do it, and the part of that user's manual, part of the, the guide to make that mantra effective and work, is to have a sympathy for the world in which we live. To have a sentiment to our place, our universe, in which we are, which we are part of. So this is called subjective approach to objective adjustment. The yogis say that another name for Supreme Consciousness is Supreme Subject. Because in its mind, it has created everything. Just as the quantum physicists say everything is a thought, it means that this consciousness has created everything. And it is witnessing, it is seeing all of its creation, playing with all of its creation. In the same way that when we think of something, we imagine something in our mind, that object, whether it's an elephant or a rubber ball or whatever, that object is our mental creation. We are looking at it as the subject. We are looking at the object. So subjective approach means we move towards the subject, the supreme subject. But we adjust, objective adjustment to the world. We're living in the world. We have responsibilities to family and community and nation and to all humans and all beings. So this subjective approach to objective adjustment. We're in the world, but we're not of this world. And my master put it very beautifully when he said, hands to work, heart to him, and endlessly active, drift in bliss. So this is the combination of the Gyan Yoga, the karma yoga, the yoga of selfless action, the gyan yoga, the yoga of knowledge, devoid of selfless action or service elements, can become very dry, as the examples of the two previous uh, meditators had, had revealed to me. But when we combine these two, moving towards our inner self and serving, helping others without desire for reward, we grow our love, our, our love element, our devotional element, and we begin to see the world with more meaning, with more purpose, and consciousness itself reveals itself, and we're attracted by the beauty of its creation, of its thought forms, in every way, at every level. And this is the path towards happiness and joy, leading us out of existential crisis, and this is the cure. So. Physically, we get physically relaxed, released from stress, and more important, mentally and spiritually, the meditation brings this new 
meaning and purpose for our life. Thank you. Namaskar.